Um, but we'll go ahead and start. Um, thank you, OPN, for being here and any of the other channels that are supporting us. We appreciate your attendance. Um, you guys know I've been talking about this for a couple of weeks now. We're really excited to be here at Star Firestorm Cafe with members of the Firestorm Collective. And I just want to say this is not the whole collective, but because they're a collective and because they're socially active, they're out doing other events. So these, this was the crew that stayed around to do the interview and help get the space uh, ready for your grand opening. So that's great. Let me do that. So um, I just want to make sure everybody's able to hear well. And if you can't, just let me know and I'll adjust it. So I think the first thing we need to do is um, introduce yourselves. And we'll start with Julie. And it would probably be helpful to say, you know, your name and how long you've been with the collective and what role each of you play in the collective. Hi, um, I'm Julie, and I've been with the collective for almost basically a year to the day. Um, and I am uh, one of the worker owners um, of the collective from October to, I guess, March. Um, and I've been an owner since March. Okay. Um, so a year and you've been a worker owner since March. And I didn't get my shot in, but the no boss is here sign that I love to show every time. Um, and so I'll, I'll need you guys to speak up because there's enough of a distance from the mic. Um, and we'll just, you know, shout it out and own it. So you next, sir. I'm Travis. I've been with the collective about a year and a half. Um, came in as an intern last year in July. Um, became an owner early this year, around January and February, um, and I, my role is as a worker owner. <laughs> <laughs> uh, great. And contestant number three. My name is Thistle, and this is my fourth month of the collective. I'm still an intern, so in a couple months I will be ready to petition for ownership and join the ranks. And without being a worker owner, I already have pretty much all the responsibilities and all the same hats. Yeah. Well, that, that's good because that's a good dry run, right, it's see, to see how you respond to it. So um, are you guys able to hear the audio pretty good? We could improve that by me moving closer and, you know, we just don't need to have me on screen, which, which you know, I think maybe we'll do that because everybody knows what I look like. So mm -hmm. let's, let's move just a smidge closer. If you, if you can, probably shouldn't though, right? The fridge has got stuff in it. Yeah. Well, uh, I think we're gonna pay for an hour. Yeah. What's well, echoey? Because we're in a in a fairly empty space with hard surfaces, so that's that. And we have the refrigerator compressor running, but they're gonna turn that off for the hour. And you know, turn up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, they're not open. So, the, and you know, they're they're renovating, which is why I was here the other night for a benefit and all that. So that that's good. So, this is good. All right. So, thank you for doing that. So, this should help with the sound a little bit. Okay. Um, well, let's first. It's a good time, I think, right off to talk about um, that the evolution from internship to worker owner in this collective. And, and I, I, I want you to speak to the fact that this is a for-profit enterprise. It's not a nonprofit model. So um, why don't you guys just tell us exactly how the, how, how would I become part of the collective? Um, so people who are interested in becoming part of Firestorm, we ask to go to an orientation first, um, which we have about once a month or as needed. Um, it's just a really good way to give everyone who's interested all the information that we have because we're such a different business model from pretty much anything you'll ever experience anywhere else. Um, so we like people to know what they're getting into before they really commit to signing an or filling out an app application and stuff. Um, after the orientation, we collect applications and resumes, we do interviews, and then we have people come in for um, like a working interview, um, doing a few shifts with us just to make sure everything's going all right, and still something that they want to do, and sort of me 
meshing. Um, and after that, we have people, and this is our past model, um, which we are under, along with our physical renovations, we're doing uh, internal restructuring as well. So this is all changing right now. But as of the past, we had people come in um, after their shadow, they're working in our new shadow shifts, um, and people would come in um, on a six to nine month track whereby developing and cultivating all those skills within the six months that they need to be an owner at the end of that term. Um, and right now we've recognized that that's a lot to bring people in on right away. So we've restructured it so that people are coming in, taking more of a day-to-day -day, um, running the space role before they get lumped with uh, like managerial tasks and more ownership and entrepreneurial. Uh, assignments and responsibilities. So we're hoping that that's going to be more beneficial for incoming interns and stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this will, so we have a, a good spectrum here. So Thistle is currently an intern, so won't you tell us what it looks like from through the intern's eyes? Um, well, uh, my experience has been with the old model, so th there wasn't really any clear phases until, you know, what responsibilities I would take on. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I got my initial training, how to make the particular sandwiches. I'd done breweries to work before, so I got, you know, quickly retrained on the machine. Um, but then, as far as stepping up into a managerial role, it's really just been, we haven't had many people in the collective. So, my experience has just been keeping things running, stepping up where needed. Um, and now we're kind of looking to make sure that that process is gradual and that you know people don't take on more responsibility until they're, they're really ready mm -hmm. and feel confident about it and can make that a conscious choice. Right. And you having been here for a while, you know, what what is your perspective? And maybe you could define the roles because is this a situation where ultimately everybody is doing everything or do you have specific tasks and rotate them or how does that work? So this will be Well, this is how it's been, and yeah. this is how it's going to change. <laughs> so you've caught us at... Like, no, it's, the perfect, time. Time. it's the perfect time. It's the perfect time, because a year from now we'll do another interview. Yes. Uh, well, yeah, so with the old model, you know, it was kind of a paradigm of everyone's going to start to do everything. There were certain roles of specialization. Uh, we used to be structured into something we called management teams that were based around some different, uh, different skills and different tasks, such as like baking, specials, like... We have a yeah, special Thistle's on, Travis is Baker, I'm one of the bookkeepers. Um, so various roles that need to be filled. Um, we're moving, but, be, but beyond those kind of like pretty specific roles, um, everyone was very much expected to do everything. And by that, I mean, you know, we have an event space that was full of events and set up for events and break down events, um, respond to inquiries for interviews and things like that. Um, maintenance, all, all kinds of, all the different things it takes to, to run the business. And I think that's where uh, a lot of the ambiguities, at least when I was an intern, maybe you felt this too, where that's where a lot of the ambiguities were, where it's like, okay, when am I expected or how am I expected to step into that mm -hmm. I'm doing everything role. Um, whereas now, with what we're moving toward is there's going to be kind of a, a greater level of specialization in that um, we'll be separating into teams that kind of parallel our business model. So we have a cafe that serves food and beverages, and that's like one management team. Um, and then we also have a bookstore, and that's going to be another management team. And then we also have our event space, and that's another one. So now it's really structured more in a way that allows people to, to know ahead of time um, they should be thinking about which aspect of the business they're most interested in, to be really engaged because it's something that they're choosing which aspect they're most interested in. Um, and uh, kind of what Travis alluded to with like the phase in of responsibilities that we're managing for the new system will be where, um, like Travis said, the first three months will be spent, you know, really kind of uh, focusing on the day-to-day, -day, how to, you know, uh, do customer service and, you know, bring people up and things like that. And then start to say, okay, am I more interested in the event space and I'm more interested in the book section and then start to kind of 
as they did with the general barista work, start to shadow that particular management team, start to come to the meetings, start to think about, okay, what does it, what does it even mean to be an entrepreneur? What does it mean to identify opportunities um, to create community partnerships or to, you know, uh, yeah, we, we use like the language of business and right. space and well, that's the conversation. I mean, you, this is the thing that you can't develop a new and independent language that nobody else can reference because then you can't communicate effectively, right? So, and I, I realize there's some sometimes a hesitation when you're trying to do a new model that you want to new, use new language because you want to break that old paradigm, but it doesn't work if you don't have those bridges to cross. Um, so, that, so that's a good point. And, and we're not like phobic holes a bunch of different ideas about it, but like I don't think we're phobic to that language of like management. Mm -hmm. We would definitely not want to, I think, use any language of a manager because then that is very much placing a set of like tasks or responsibilities into an identity, into an individual, and right. that's what we're trying to fight against. It's not right. that, and then right like here, you're not managing people, you're managing systems. Right. That's a really, really good way to to frame that, managing systems, not people, because all the people are self-managed, yeah. essentially. So um, just to clarify, are you a hierarchical organization or horizontal? Uh, we maintain as much horizontality as possible, and we are pretty much horizontal, but there, there's always natural hierarchies that sort of come into play with experience and skill levels, um, but we, we do take steps to to try and soothe those out by passing on skill shares and having people, allowing people to step up into roles if they're choosing so and trying to watch how much sort of knowledge is based within one person mm -hmm. and scatter that out so it's not, so it's not our culture. Share, sure, there's enough for everybody, exactly. right? <laughs> yeah. Um, so the, I, I like to, you know, I'm watching a live chat as we're talking. Um, so I have my kind of sequence of questions, which they want me to throw out because they want to get into the nuts and bolts. So we'll we'll go ahead. People are tweeting. Yeah, <laughs> people are tweeting. We have to we have to get answers. So um, it's there, it looks like some of the questions are coming up around um, what does it mean to be an owner? How um, what do you guys do around you know owner or or, or benefits? Are there any? Uh, you know, Social Security, Disability, Workman's Comp, blah, 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 all that, that typical business stuff. Um, if you're a fully owned, worker-owned collective, how is it determined, you know, salaries and, or where does all that? So if somebody, as much as you're comfortable with, sketch out some of that because that's a, I mean, it's a good question, right? Because you guys make it work and, and that's unusual that it's made to work. So. We were interested in that. Well, uh, it, it wouldn't work for everyone. Um, it works for us because we're really dedicated. We definitely think of this as a labor of love, very much so. Uh, we are a for-profit, so we do we bring in a lot of revenue, um, but because we do things differently than other businesses, um, we we're not we don't really have the ability at this point to pay ourselves um, as as much as we would like to in order to really be able to you know, not have to have second incomes and things like that. Um, so in terms of like paying out like health benefits and things like that, that's not something that the collective, uh, we've never even talked about it because we've, we've been far from it. Right. Um, but as we are, um, when we have insurance, you know, mm. if, if someone was to be injured on the job or something like right, that, right. that obviously exists. Um, in terms of ownership uh, of the business, um, because we are all putting in like equal labor, um, the owners buying in as an owner, whereas like the worker co-ops, the um, ownership share is like a significant amount of money. It's pretty nominal here. So right. the, the idea is it's basically, in a way, symbolic. I mean, it exists. You right. pay some money, but um, it's basically symbolic um, in order to, that, that the amount of money is. But then um, being an owner means that you have a responsibility to keep the project moving forward, mm -hmm. there's an expectation that you're going to be there long term, um, and of course, as, as a business, if there are any um, loan, like if there are any debt obligations, that's something that's like shared equally among the owners, which I guess would be um, uh, like a hard difference between interns and owners, right. interns wouldn't necessarily share any of the liability for, for that. 
So the predecessor to ownership requires a human investment so that you have a personal, it's, it's not Starbucks, you just don't show up and all that. You have a personal investment of whether it's clean or what. So there's a motivating factor because it has a direct effect on you and your livelihoods. Um, I wonder if one of you can speak to the specific difference between cooperatives and collectives. Um, there's a lot of misunderstanding. I'm really clear on it, but uh, I think maybe that would be a helpful thing. So the differences between cooperatives and collectives. Uh, well, a collective doesn't necessarily signify too much besides a group of people. As far as I know, there's no formal definition on what a collective is. Um, and there are a few different types of cooperatives. What we are is a worker-owned cooperative, whereas as there's like consumer-owned cooperatives, um, stuff like that agricultural cooperatives, yeah. But we're a worker on cooperative, which literally means that everyone who who is working here is, is seeking or has some sort of ownership role within it, um, like Julie just said. Right. And is that equal ownership top to bottom or new to old, however we want to phrase it? So like does everybody have an equal stake in, in the collective once they're owners? Yeah, which is, in my experience, somewhat different from cooperatives. Cooperatives generally have a board, then you have a buy-in, then there's different levels, so it's definitely hierarchical. Right, and, and that's like where like the union of like the cooperative model and the collective model here is. And also, the other thing about cooperatives is that they are not most that are not collectives are not operated as democratically as a collective would be. Um, you have uh, kind of the idea that you. I think the way most work of co-ops work is that um, when you become an owner, you have the ability to vote for management or outline some kind of, uh, you have the ability to shape either who is the manager or owner of the business or the policies they put into place. So it is a far more democratic environment than like a traditional business model. But at the end of the day, you still have a manager, you still aren't deciding everything for yourself. Whereas when you bring in the aspect of a collective, which here is that you're actually keeping that democratic structure going throughout all the way through. Um, and this this conversation of structure is near and dear to us because um, you know I I actually got into what I do here as a result of Occupy and so we've interviewed we've interviewed C T Butler and Keith McHenry and you know all the consensus modeling people. So uh, maybe now's a good time to talk about um, how the decision making process happens within your collective because I know in order to do the interview you brought it up at the collective meeting and I guess there was consensus because here I am so thank you for that. But let, let's talk about that because we've seen you know there's been a lot of visible failures of the consensus model. Um, we yet again we're pointing to this as a success of how that works. So let's talk about that a little bit. Your decision making processes as a collective. Um, so, like you said, we use consensus decision making process. Um, and I would say, from my perspective, it works a lot better here than some of those fa failures that we've seen mainstream or experienced. Like here, we have an Occupy movement that. Um, that was fairly strong, good attendance, and tried to use consensus. And I'd say the biggest difference that played a played a big role in that not working so well is that there's there's not a core group or not a core core ideal that they were dedicated to. Mm -hmm. um, whereas we have a working model here, we have goals, we have principles that we are founded on that everyone agrees to adhere to mm -hmm. when we're here. So when we're making decisions as a consensus body, it's a lot easier to maintain that mindset of knowing where we all want to be. Um, and should I describe consensus? Is that worth it? Uh, no, I think everybody's pretty pretty okay. clear on, on the theoretical model of how it's supposed to work. But I, I do want to make the point is because you have focus, you have purpose, and you have principles. So those serve as the touchstone when whenever things start to get off into the weeds a little bit. And, and it's also, um, I really like what Travis said, um, that there's a sense of purpose helping. Um, but it, it's also that we have like a 
pre-existing structure for generating the proposals that, that people make? Do you want to take a moment to... Yeah, yeah, let's introduce, and we need to like figure <laughs> out really, really close. I'll, and I'll just, if everybody will bear with me, we have, we have somebody new to join us that just came from an event, so introduce yourself. Yeah. Or you just sit and walk in and say, hey, here's some people, let's talk. <laughs> and um, did you come from the event in Black Mountain? Yes, I did. I just came from the Southeastern Women's Urban Conference. Okay, great. Great. Well, thanks for joining us. I know you're probably tired. I'm going to move I'm back a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> All right. We just got into the interesting stuff. We're talking about a consensus process. Yeah. yeah. I'm going to move this back a little bit and see if I can't get everybody. Okay. During the remodeling, this wall needs to be moved. <laughs> Let me, if you guys will bear with, me, bear with me just a little bit. I'm gonna. Should we move them? No, no, you're you're good. It's easier for me to. I'm gonna try to do like an oblique angle, and then maybe I can get more of you in there. But then the sound. Okay. Sorry, everybody watching. I'm just trying to get everybody in the picture, but. We'll, we'll twist. We'll twist and turn. It'll all work out fine. This is this is how you know it's live when it's chaotic, right? Um, a Alu. A a okay. I'm really bad with names. Alu Thistle. I forgot yours already. And Julie. What? Travis. Travis. Okay. Thanks. Um, so let's go. Julie was talking a little bit about the consensus model and decision making. Uh, yeah. So. We have, we have the benefit of having kind of a, a commonality of purpose, and that definitely helps us. But I think a lot of times the, the narrative around consensus and like whether it works or how well it works is about you know whether people can, can make decisions together, and, and the, the emphasis gets put on the end point of the decision. Um, and that often like masks the, the hard work that has to go into all the steps before you actually make the decision. Um, decision making is not usually actually that difficult when everyone is really well informed and really invested and has you know done their own research and has you know I mean for us what, like pricing things out and figuring out timetables and things like that um, and so for us we found that consensus can be really hard and a really slogging process when people when when proposals basically which are like you know the units of content that people are like bringing to any consensus situation, um, when those proposals are not well fleshed out, they're not thought out, and you come and you're like, I have this idea, it's the greatest idea ever, and people are like, well, what about X, Y, and Z, and you're like, oh, man, <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and our, and sometimes that happens here, and sometimes it doesn't, but I think we're, we're getting better, and like movements can get better at um, doing their due diligence before you bring a proposal that you're actually able to speak to some of the contingencies of what that will mean and how it will impact different, you know, different aspects of what you're doing. Um, and, and that's really, I, I feel like when you do that, it's not really that hard to make decisions because we answer each other's questions and then if there are aspects that need to be tweaked, it's so much easier to do that because it's not just this big floating question mark, you know, people mm. are like, oh, I see what you're saying and I see how we can make this meet all of our needs. Right. So it's like be organized on the front end and do the work and then everybody has better information to work with in the process. And so does the collective meet as a group to make decisions or, um, and, and how many people total were in the collective? Right now we're at a low point of six. Yeah. Low point six. Okay, six. So we have, we have two thirds of the collective here. This is great. <laughs> <laughs> and Elu, I, I forgot to ask what your role is currently. Are you um, intern, owner? What's I am an intern. You're an intern. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, so we got the interns here and the owners here, and it's all great. Everybody's getting along good. <laughs> um, so if take a moment and step us through one of your meetings. How often do they happen? Um, do you have agendas? Do you run it on a timeline? Like, because sometimes those things can go on forever. So, tell us about your your meetings. Um, so we meet as a general body um, every two weeks um, with clear proposals that have gone out via email, ideally at least 24 hours ahead. Sometimes a 
that's not quite held up, but that's, that's what we like to have is everyone knows what the proposals are going to be for the next day by Saturday night, they're able to give input or do research or whatever, or at least process them a little bit um, by themselves. Then we come, and those proposals are usually generated um, through our previous model um, within the management teams, um, whether it be like cafe management team or whatever, Julie spoke to those earlier. Um, so, so it's not just usually an individual who's bringing some idea that they've never talked about before or anything like that. It's usually something that we're all pretty aware of and has been discussed thoroughly with other people. Um, and then we meet on Sundays in the afternoon. Um, and sometimes it goes longer than others, like four or five hours. We've definitely been here before. Uh -huh. and we do big agendas or big, um, big items. Um, but that's definitely originating those within a, a smaller body um, definitely streamlines the process. Right. And do interns participate in the collective meetings, mm -hmm. like all of them? And so are you guys, um, do you get to participate in proposals? So you're fully participating as if you were, are, I love that. That's just brilliant. Well, it's just great on the job training, right? <laughs> um, and are you, do you, okay, I kind of, like you, you would talk within your particular group or management team. So you vet ideas that way and they bubble up, then you bring them to the collective meeting. Okay, it seems really efficient to me and you know, I, I admire you guys for doing that. Um, what, uh, so I'm gonna use some business terminology which makes me cringe, but what is the, um, the, the goal, what is the mission, vision, and values of Firestorm Collective in the Firestorm Cafe? Oh. Mm -hmm. the name of the question. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's six of them. <laughs> okay, no, that's good. I mean, that's a good point to make. So, yeah, you guys, you guys, you guys speak up because it's, it's important to realize that there are different viewpoints and different ideas and different visions, but the, the beauty is that you guys are figuring out how to make that work together. So, you know, people would love to hear about that. And, hey, Lou, do you want to chime in on that? And you can speak up. <laughs> <laughs> um, you have to respect it. I'm very camera shy. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, I don't want to make you uncomfortable, so. Okay. <laughs> okay, Travis With, could go. Without referencing the collective's objectives, like a general model is to create value within the space both you know, social value, creating space for community events, for people to organize and meet and share ideas, to have radical literature, to have you know, a source for this information, um, to eventually be able to pay ourselves a living wage so that you know, we can sustain this motion and keep people in the collective that have skills and to not have to burn out by keeping second jobs. Yeah, that's probably like one short-term model. And then once we've been able to pay ourselves a living wage, uh, the collective is set up such that any excess profit beyond that will be distributed into uh, different community pro projects in the form of grants that the collective will decide which things they're most interested in. Right, so once you meet your basic needs, you're gonna essentially give give out the surplus to help other people meet theirs. Is that fair? Which we already are kind of doing you know, every day just by undercutting basically what is like the bottom line of a typical business. Uh, people are probably like familiar with the idea of you know, double, triple bottom line. Um, that being the, you know, the, the, the money bottom line, but there's also um, the social benefit that you're trying to give, uh, whether that's like broadly construed or whether that's like a very specific thing. Um, so there's a number of things that we do that do take revenue out of uh, out of our project, but that is totally worth it to us. For instance, like providing um, the use of computers on site, not just wireless, which we do, but also like actual computer terminals um, that people can use. Where the only other place in town that you can do that is the public library. Mm -hmm. The public. Yeah. Right, and you have to have an ID card, and yeah. So in a way, like we're providing even beyond what the yeah what the library is providing. But um, you know, of course we're not receiving public funds for doing that. That's just coming out of, out of what we have. Right, right. Um so tell us a little bit about 
and I, I can speak to what drew me in here, but tell us about how you guys interact and engage with the community and what the purpose of the cafe is relevant to the community. Well, the fire storm was really like born out of um, a time in Asheville when a bunch of mutual aid resources like kind of died off. Um, I can't remember the names of the mm -hmm. the ACRC. The ACRC, and, and then there was another info shop that ended up um, getting kaput. And so Firestorm sort of stepped up to fulfill that niche, and we actually weren't even near financially viable to create Firestorm as an entity at that time, but but we thought that it was such a um, intense need of Asheville mm -hmm. to have the community space here. And then, so I think that like one of our biggest projects is to create a space for the community to become radicalized, to have access to literature, to have free event space, to have access to computers, even just meeting space, meeting space, even just existing in a space for just free. A, a place to come and sit in the middle of the day for yeah. half an hour without having to buy anything. Mm -hmm. right. Right. You know, when all available space in the city is commercial space or pathways where you're expected to keep moving between them, you know, there's limited options for where people can go. Mm -hmm. And even in the park, like if people sit for too long, they get put on by police. Like, I mean, that's just the <laughs> we're live. <laughs> no, that that's that's no, no, that's fine. <laughs> um, but in in general, um, I think what we're really trying to provide is a dialogue on um, on what community space is um, or what what space is really, yeah. <laughs> and um, and use that to help radicalize our community. Either. That, that was so eloquently spoken too. I, I, I it kind of you like took the picture in my head, and that's you spoke to it. Thank you. Anybody else want to chime in? Your thoughts on the space and how it engages relative to the community? Well, like reflecting on the way that we are hoping to maybe like shift a little bit um, is I really like what Ailey said too, and um, I think kind of what you presented is the idea that this is like an open space for people to fill up with community. Um, I think going forward, I'm really excited about um, figuring out how we as a collective can start to like shape that a little bit more in terms of like us actually offering as a collective things that we want to bring to people's minds, whether that's, you know, hosting a, like a monthly film series or a lecture series or workshops that we really want to to either like start and do ourselves or just ally with like other community organizations like there, there's like a preschool here and maybe people don't even know that um, and just kind of work with different community projects and really nurture them in a way that we've been so I think that was unfortunately no one who started this space is here uh, there's one collective member who, who's been here since the beginning um, who isn't sitting here right now, but um, they could speak much more to kind of like the foundational ideas about what the space is going to be. But my understanding is that it's been um, basically like the the day to day of, of keeping this place going um, is a lot, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and and it takes up a lot. And um, perhaps now, after recognizing and adapting to how much that takes. Um, swinging back around some of the initial like motivation for not to say that we ever lost the community focus, but just right. that now we want to figure out how to actually like schedule that in really right. and, and make that something that um, that we're actively cultivating yeah. as opposed to just being a place where if you want to do a workshop, you can. It's like I want people to know. I want us to be putting calls out. You want a programming element yeah. um, because yeah. because it is keeping the doors open is is a challenge especially um, did, did the facility the building itself open in 2008 is that because my research was that's when the collective itself started but I can't remember if the coffee shop cafe opened that early do any of you guys yeah so you, well, you don't own the space. We're yeah, renters. right. You you rent. So um, which is a good point to make because 
Um, Firestorm Collective grew out of a need, you know, as Ailey said, it grew out of a need um, at a time when the economy was taking a nosedive. So it was a pretty brave and idealistic endeavor to open such a thing in that environment and even to keep it afloat and keep the doors open nonstop since then. Um, and what what drew me into it the first time was exactly that, that it, it is the only place in Asheville that purports itself to be very progressive and liberal, that you could come in and it was open and inviting and welcoming and you you bore no expense, you just had to come in and be a decent person and then it was all here for you. So um, I, I really love that about the place. Um, <laughs> So let's talk about, um, so here's sort of a political question. Would you guys, or individually, not collectively, but do you guys define yourselves as anarchists or progressives or conservatives or how, how do you, or do you even <laughs> care? Labels. Yeah, labels. Want to say that louder so everybody can hear it? <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm an anarchist. Circle fucking A. There you go. <laughs> yeah. I, yeah. Yeah, I identify as such. I don't like to use the word because it's loaded and a lot of people don't understand yeah, it. Yeah. So it's like, yeah, to other anarchists, I'm an anarchist. Yeah. To so someone on the street, I'm pissed <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I identify as an anarchist. Okay, and, and I, I, I presume that because I kind of have that same position too. And what you said was the reason I asked the question, because it is a loaded word. It's thrown around. People do not understand the definition. And for all the viewers and the chatters out there, I'm going to do a show on it, on specifically on anarchy sometime soon this fall, uh, because it, um, there's actually a lot of compelling reasons to look into that. Um, but I think you guys represent what you're doing here is at the root of anarchy which is personal responsibility community good and and it just I'm so impressed it just makes my heart go pitter pat um, so let's talk about um, the thing that blew me away the first time I came in I came in I was like okay this is great look at those books <laughs> Because you cannot find those books. Let's let's talk about the bookstore element. The, who wants to speak to that? All right, here we go. I used to come into Firestorm um, every like Friday, Saturday um, of my week, and just like peruse the book section. And one of the best things was that, was that like there was all this literature that you couldn't find anywhere else. Like I'd never even seen a bookstore like this. I've seen like a few in info shops, but like to have such a like um, specialized selection like we do here. And then I would like sit down and read a whole book, <laughs> and no one would mess with me. <laughs> and I was like, wow, <laughs> this isn't like our local like bookstores where you're not allowed to touch things and like people trying to make you buy things and and. Um, and I can actually learn stuff and then talk to the people on shift about what I'm learning and then like I want to work here. <laughs> but um but yeah, we've got great books. Yeah, yeah, what kind what kind of books? Subject matter. Let this is not Barnes and Nobles people. <laughs> I'm so, here to tell you. So we have a really wide um, selection of history, of activism, of Social justice, economics. anarchist thinkers, gender politics, racial politics, prisons and policing, sustainable issues, living, which are pretty much the same as prisons and policing, mm -hmm. pirates, pirates, pirates and ninjas, <laughs> that's an important part. Basically, the, the, the radical edge of a lot of the typical sections that you would find in, in a larger bookstore, but just with a, a particular perspective that is often excluded from, from those places or is just so lost in the morass that you can't find it. And then also like a lot, um, maybe what seems out of place to people, like a lot of books about um, like permaculture and um, we have relationships with a few different publishers that are really amazing, like AK Press, mm -hmm. which is itself 
um, a collective, and everyone should go online and read AK Press's mission statement, because I read it the other day, and I was like, this is exactly like Firestorm, first of all, and second of all, it's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> um, just beautifully articulated uh, expression. Of I'm a big fan. I've never seen AK Press books anywhere except here, ever. Yeah, yeah they're a little bit strangely hard to come by. And then also PM Press and Chelsea Green are other, uh, other special relationships that we have. And, and having those as anchors of our collection is, uh, I mean, you, you can't calculate the, the worth of it. It's so, right. it's so amazing. Um, the bookstore is seems to me in in addition you guys have a huge zine you know selection uh, expanding. you're expanding the zine selection so that's good I'm a big fan of the zine as a communication vehicle but um, you know that involves the community it also helps to directly transfer information some people are are asking, do you guys sell books or do you just let people come in and read? Well, you, you do sell them. <laughs> that is the goal. It is a for-profit, but the beautiful thing is they allow people to come sit in the nice sofas and, and read them and they don't, don't hassle people. And that in itself is an educate, educational forum. Um, so it's, it's well spent. Um, demographics. What Give me the age span of the collective members. Oh, collective members. Mm -hmm. 20, 21 to 31? Mm -hmm. 21 to 31? Mm -hmm. They sound like they're pretty. Anyway. <laughs> they think we're, all in our, we're all in our below 30 right. at the moment. But it hasn't always been that way. Right. Um, so a fairly, fairly youthful group of worker owners, which um, is great that you guys are able to navigate existing environments at such a young age. Keep that up. It's really impressive. What about the public you serve? What's the demographics of the people that come in? Yeah. <laughs> if you were to watch our, the, the uh, patrons that come in um, for an hour, you would have a lot of folks that come into this space. Some people are business folks just trying to get their coffee in the morning. Some people are students trying to like do their homework. Um, some people are houseless and just trying to find a place to hang out. There's a lot of different folks. You get a gold star for saying houseless. We, we did an interview Thursday night with Mary Nichols out of Portland that does the visual TV project and we, we had that whole discussion about homeless versus houseless so um, that makes me happy you used to use the word. Um, and I would say uh, not too long ago, I was in here for three hours, just hanging out and drinking coffee, kind of working on this stuff. And you're, you're right, there are no two people, there, there is no predictable demographic that comes in here. But everybody seems to come in with a good vibe. Or if they don't, once they hit the door, the vibe washes over them. <laughs> I mean, you could see it, right? But that, I saw people much older than me here. I saw what would probably be a couple of houseless people. I saw a couple of kids doing homework. Uh, it, it was beautiful. It's the most egalitarian and diverse place in Asheville. Well, I was going to say, not to idealize it, but you know, not not everyone that comes in is bringing that to the table, and some people are bringing you know such negativity, you know that. We can't wash over them, and you know, like to, to to make it out to be like, you know, because it is a benefit that anyone can come in here, and that you can be in here for free. But there are legitimate needs that you know the space as a business and other patrons need. So like, there is some element of policing people that. <laughs> I would just, I would really, I would only disagree with the term. <laughs> it's really interesting to actually navigate that kind of experience because you know. Sometimes folks come in here and they are inebriated and, you know, causing a ruckus because of that or, like, you know, doing something patriarchal or something like that. You know, it, there are times in which we, as collective members, have to step up and, and create a dialogue with the patrons that come into our space. And we actually take that as a really 
big responsibility um, on our Philippines Collective um, to, to help further the educational aspects of our city mm. and create dialogue. So conflict resolution, how do you how do you deal with that? We have a system. <laughs> oh no, this is great. I love a system. <laughs> no, I'm talking about customer conflict resolution. So and then we'll talk about internal conflict yeah. resolution. Yeah. Well the thing is is that um, what most folks would call customers in our space, we call patrons because not everyone coming into our space okay. is actually um, spending money. Um, but well, you and I are going to talk after this because I have this whole thing going on about reclaiming language, and you're you're ahead of me by miles. So <laughs> this is this is good because definitely words <laughs> words and definitions matter. So thank you for pointing that out. Yeah, I just wanted to make sure that we weren't just talking about customers. Right. Um. So yeah. The wait, there was a question. Uh, okay. Oh yeah. Okay. So we patron we conflict resolution. Patron conflict resolution. We have a, like a, a tiered system of, um, of warnings, and then and then we end up having a mediated conversation if it gets escalated enough to where you're on final warning, and then eventually we ask people not to, to come back into our space right. if, if they're repeated. So you have limits, and you have boundaries, and you have procedures that are fair and equitable. And you stick to them, and that works well for it, the most part? It works pretty well. And that was one of the first things that really struck me when I joined Firestorm. Um, I had never seen such a, a committed group, a group so committed to um, enacting like a model of transformative or at least restorative justice and not just like, okay, you, you're causing a problem, let alone we're not going to call the police, right? Um, because we're, we try to avoid um, corresponding with the police in any way um, whenever possible. So not just we're not going to call the police on you, but we're also going to actually try to engage in dialogue with you, even if we feel wronged by you, um, and what that looks like. Um, and for us, what that looks like is, like Ayla was saying, you know, a series of warnings where, you know, we make contact with someone and say, hey, like, this is the behavior that we're seeing that like is really making it hard for us to do what we need to do. Um, and then if that kind of doesn't work, then we ask someone not to come back until they come to one of our weekly meetings that we talked about earlier and actually come and sit down with us and talk about the issue. And sometimes we go into those conversations feeling like there's nothing this person could say that's going to make us really want to deal with them for a while again uh, because we feel so much trust has been broken or something so egregious that occurred. Um, but we still offer the conversation regardless just so that it can at least be a communication about it. Um, but nine times out of ten, I think we go into those conversations feeling like the dialogue we have with this person is really going to impact what we say um, what we say to them about whether we want them, whether they're welcome back in the space or not. Um, <coughs> and, and I guess that's why I would push against the characterization of it as policing, not because we're not telling people what we want them to do. We are. We are telling people what we want them to do. Um, we very much are because we have, like you said, our own boundaries. Um, but it's not policing because it's not unilateral. It's not one-sided. It's not, I'm going to tell you to this and you're going to shut up. Correct. It's, I'm going to hear from you and we're going to have a discussion. Um, it's a collective effort with, with an equal exchange. So. Um, that's fantastic, and I love the way you guys use the language. I'm, I'm serious about that. Um, so, does the same uh, process happen with any internal conflicts? I mean, surely you, you must have them. Everybody does, right? And you follow the same sort of pro process. I have to say here, Travis, you are the person who here. Yes, the last major conflict. Um, so, Firestorm's got a history of some internal conflicts that weren't resolved so so greatly, I suppose. Um, and it's, it's been an ongoing struggle to identify those systems of accountability where we can interact in a way that's, that's transformative or restorative um, within our own collective. Because we're, it's a group of, of people who are friends or who become friends, but are also trying to hold each other accountable um, within, our, within our given 
system here in our project. So it's a, it's a difficult obstacle to, uh, to navigate around. And before, what it's looked like is um, either mediated by third party meetings if it gets that bad. Um, it rarely, if ever, it, it rarely gets that bad. It, I've only seen that happen in a few months. And uh, so it generally, it just comes down to people calling each other out um, or saying, well, I was hurt in this way. It just relies a lot on communication, which we is really the, the essential part of being in the classroom here. Yep. Maintaining the conversation. Also, I mean, I've definitely seen tensions rise between collective members and I want to point out, in case anybody watching missed it, how just the way you you speak, you've already taken ownership. You know, you say you say our collect. I mean, it's personal to you, it, it, even though you're at the intern level right now. And that just, I think that speaks to what you you were just saying. You have a personal investment, and I think that's the beauty of it. I think you don't really see much of a like a division. I don't I don't find that there is um, a di divisive nature between worker ownership and um, internship um, within our collective. It seems that everyone's taking a hat, taking names, and fighting the system. <laughs> <laughs> and like so much so that I I couldn't imagine it even getting to like a point where a mediation would be necessary anymore mm -hmm. because um, we just like we just wouldn't stand for like behavior that would even get to that level. Right. It's just um, not an acceptable paradigm. It's not acceptable and, and like not to say that, you know, there's bad people and we wouldn't let them in, but just like we are so cohesive right now <coughs> and part of it is that we're small, right? Like we're a small group. Um, we're so cohesive and we're working so well together at this point that I think anything that seemed discordant with that would be so apparent, right? Because like we're really functional right now. And so if we saw a red flag from someone who came into the collective or even from someone who was a current collective member who just started, you know, acting in a different way, like no one would just let that go. Mm -hmm. Like internal dynamics would not be allowed to get to a point where where all of a sudden you're like, who am I working with? Right. That's that's kind of like why we have the system of checking in. It's like we all, well, in, in future firestorms, all of us will get um, internal reviews and and be constantly checked by the collective to make sure that we're still working on our shit and that like um, you don't just like wake up three months later and and like well, why am I doing messed up things to my collective members? You know, you you understand how your behaviors are affecting you. I love that. I also just I have this picture in my mind of the collective meetings going on, it's getting tense, and somebody says, wait a minute, we have the best resource library in Western North Carolina, let's go <laughs> grab the book and figure this out. So it, it's great, right? I, I think it's fantastic. Um, yeah. I, I wanted to reflect on maybe going back to the consensus thing a little bit. We had recently a situation where we went into a meeting that <coughs> where there was actually an issue that folks had really different ideas about. There was kind of two different viewpoints um, that were represented in that situation. And uh, the details of it honestly don't even matter, but basically it was it was one of the very, probably the, like the most extreme example of where people had like specific different opinions. It wasn't just like, oh, I don't know. It was like this, this, this one, and this one. We had two different things. Um, and everyone came into it, I think, like chill and, and ready to hear each other, but at the same time, right, because we do all get along, we really care about each other. So we didn't come in combative, but at the same time, I think there was a lot of apprehension of how are we going to reconcile these two things? Because they're opposite. They involve concrete resources like money and time. Um, and 
And we did it. We did it by using the essence of consensus process, and, and consensus rarely works this well, where you're not just compromising, you're actually collaborating on decision-making structures, you're actually synthesizing. And we were actually capable to come to, come to a, a resolution that not only had us walking away being like, why don't we feel bad? Like, why don't we feel worse right now? You know, but actually felt so triumphant. Or like, I, I did. I don't know if other people's experience of that was the same, but um, where there seemed to be this, like, insurmountable difference, and and it was just surmounted by, by the desire to actually hear each other's needs. And, and that was, you used a, a word for the, the method Exercise and empathy? I never heard that before. But basically, like. What was that? An exercise in empathy? Yeah. yeah. Like it's just recognizing, yeah, feeling with everyone. And it's like, well, how are you feeling about this process? You know, the decision. Yeah. That's what can feel with. <laughs> <laughs> feeling with. Feeling yeah. with. Feel together. Um, yeah. um, and that's really what it is. We were looking at, like, a timeline <coughs> for a big, involved process. We were emotionally burnt out. We needed to hear everyone's needs. And so for some people, there was, I need to schedule enough time that this won't be rushed for other people, you know, like, so, and just that check-in of, like, really, it's like, we recognize we were all stressed, like, we, you know, there was, no one coming in there, I'm going to get my way, it was, you know, we're going to walk out of this with an agreement that suits us all. And something Julie said um, in a orientation, an orientation um, a while ago that I heard just made me feel really great about consensus, and it was like, Truly uh, sharing that that sometimes they went into consensus process or with a proposal, and by virtue of hearing other people's thoughts of their proposal, they they heard so many ideas that they couldn't have, have even fathomed mm -hmm. without having space for people to talk about how they felt about a proposal and really creating space for for even marginalized people who like don't you know don't normally feel comfortable or like they have space and, and meeting, meeting structures to, to come forward with how they're feeling about proposals and, and things like that. But like by virtue of other folks chiming in that it strengthens their proposal and that that you end up having a much better end result. And I'm yeah, like the goal wasn't to get like my proposal passed, the goal was to get the best possible the goal is to bring the best possible possible proposal that you can as like a jumping off point and then you just get you just plus the goal. <laughs> yes, yeah, it's, it's a point of departure to get to something just better. And um, I, it's just heartens me to hear it doesn't it, always. Well <laughs> well but you know it works enough that you have history that when it gets really sticky you can go, well remember that time it was worse than this and we figured it out mm -hmm. and it gives you like, okay, yeah, we can do this. So it gives you some historical yeah, confidence. Exercise and empathy is like, I, I would say like a really good, I didn't know to use those words, but Ailey used them and that was super helpful. Like as a tool in the toolbox of consensus, because obviously your audience is folks who are very, very uh, familiar with these things. So maybe just like share something that's been helpful for me as, as just kind of almost like a facilitator's tool is when you have a different perspectives that's represented instead of trying to mush them into one, you kind of invite people to assume the perspective of the other people, and that's where like the exercise and empathy is, of like, if you, were to, if you were to know that that other thing that you aren't actually repping for it, it was gonna go forward, what would make you feel better about it? What would, what would you need to be true along with that different perspective from yours to make you feel okay about moving forward? Because basically, like, don't know, consensus, you know, you're trying to avoid blocks, essentially. You're trying to, you know that you may not get exactly what you want, but you're trying to avoid someone saying, if this goes down, I'm gone. Or if this goes down, I'm going to be just so unhappy that I'm going to be miserable and make everyone else miserable. And, and kind of forcing people to realize that there's more flexibility in their own thought pattern than they even realize um, is super helpful. Partially an educational process, and in, in all of us realizing that that there is more there. Um, so you you heard it here today, folks. We have example of a consensus model that works. Yay! <laughs> Good for you guys.
<laughs> yeah, if you're six people, six hundred, I don't know. Uh, well, you've got to start somewhere, right? So I'm gonna I'm gonna take the, this camera and I just want to show people the empty space right now. Oh, no, 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 this is good, right? Because this is um, Firestorm has been renovating for a month. They've been closed to the public. They opened their doors again on Tuesday. Um, the Monday the 29th. Oh, we bumped it a little bit. Yeah. Okay. Well, that. <laughs> oh, okay. No, no, it's good. So, okay, we're going to reopen the 29th. And so, well, I mean, perfect, right? Because I was thinking, that's pretty pretty yeah. ambitious, you know. And, and you, you could probably do it, and you could probably kill yourselves in the process. So good for you for being smart enough to know what your timetable needs to be. But I just want to give everybody a glimpse. Bear with me. I'm doing this with shaky cam. So this is the Firestorm Cafe Collective Empty, and what's going to happen is I'm going to come back here, there's the counter, there's the sign. Yeah, because it's your Coca-Cola for a little visual interesting. There's, yep, and True Cost of Coal, and then there's that. So that's what it looks like today, and I'm totally going to come back and uh, show them all the bright shiny and the book. So um, I know you guys have a lot to do, but I have just a couple more questions, and then because um, it's been great talking with you guys. Now this thing's being cranky pants. There we go. Um, so why don't you tell us what comes? You know, what are we going to see after the renovation? What's 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 on stack for Firestorm? as a facility and as a collective? Um, so along with the structural reorganization that Julie talked about before, where we are now managing within a cafe team, a venue team, and a bookstore team, we've kind of separated our space out physically to accommodate that a little better. So uh, people who are familiar with the space will notice that we've um, we pushed the We've sort of uh, pushed the chairs all together for the cafe seating um, and then moved the books um, into a bigger focus into the center of our space. Um, not to mention the painting we've done. We, uh, we had some nasty looking carpet in here before that is gone. Uh, we've got a nice concrete floor now. Um, We've also installed a, uh, a laptop bar for individual users to come in and, and not take up a floor top, right. just to browse the internet, um, uh, as well as improving our in-house computer terminals, um, moving those. We have, we're back up to three again now, whereas we, we were at three, we dropped down to two, because one of them broke for about a year, um, back up to three now. and. Uh, you're going to expand the zine selection? I, I was actually referring to the entire bookstore. Okay. So, um, we're you seem to have a special interest in the bookstore. <laughs> I'm on the bookstore. Well, I'm on the bookstore team. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm also on the venue team. But, but yeah, I, I let my team. Um, yeah. <laughs> did you have the, have the new booking class that's got auto, auto trinkles? There was, there was, I said yeah. that. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, so so um, we are expanding the, the bookstore. We're actually um, trying to really uh, narrow in on, on our system at which we decide what we host in this space and what the space is used for. Mm -hmm. um, I'm really, really excited about where that's going. There's some talk about preschooling up here. But, and, and oh, sometimes they will. Like, I don't know if they can do everything. They can't. They can't. Yeah. They can't. Yeah. Certainly not. But, you know, you know, flag making workshops and things like that. Excellent. Um, yeah, so there's the... I see that in future Firestorm, our space is going to be used a lot differently. In my journey as a dream. Excellent. <laughs> I, love, I love the vision of it. Um, and then the last question I have before we wrap up is... A lot of people are asking for a reading list. Ah, we definitely do that. So it already kind of exists 
on our website. Okay. Um, there's like a, you can search like a Firestorm Essentials. I uh -huh. can't forget exactly what, how you navigate to it. But on our website, you can uh, navigate to some kind of like Firestorm Read Essentials list. There's also our own catalog available yeah. for browsing. Yeah. So. But yeah, our reading list. We have a newsletter that comes out online basically monthly. Check out our record Oh, yeah. yeah there's also a record But those aren't like stable. Yeah. You know, like we just change it. And then it all right, I got four people. I want four books. So I'm going to type them in right now. Okay, so here we go. This is this is live stream reading list. Julie's going to go first. I only get to say one. <laughs> yeah, everybody gets one because I can't type so fast. Okay. Okay, you can have more than one. I'll type as fast as I can. No, it's okay. Um, I'm so torn. I'll, t I'll, I'll do one too. And these are perhaps a little bit more mainstream, um, but... The New Dream Crow by Michelle Alexander and uh, The Shock Doctrine by Naomi Klein are, uh, they'll, they'll change how you think about things. They're part of this uh, kind of new wave of, of books that come out of like a really like rigorous journalistic tradition as well as like a sociological tradition of having just crazy amounts of data to back up your point where you basically make this like incredibly astute claim about why things work the way they work, especially in regard to like power um, and how power manifests and how it keeps people oppressed um, and how the situation, the system perpetuates itself, makes like an awesomely astute kind of like high flown claim that if it wasn't able to back itself up with this incredible amount of data it would seem just like, okay, well that's what you say radical, but I'm not going to listen to you, but then just proceeds to just knock it out of the park so that you cannot refute uh, what they say, and it just it, like go read it. You're getting a lot of shout, shouts out on the shock doctor. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, and the new Jim Crow. Check yeah. it out too. Okay, and what we're if you like the shock doctor? Yeah, so pe I'm doing these, and some people are copying them, putting them in a pad so the people can catch them. So, so Travis. Um, last book I read that I really liked was Hillbilly Nationals: Urban Race Rebels and Black Power. Oh, 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 Hillbilly Nationals. It's one book. It's one book. Urban. Urban Race Rebels and Black Power. Okay. Um, that was really good. It was a really good uh, illustration and experience uh, of someone who's, a, who, who's coming into a cross-cultural organization within like a lower class cast, I guess would be a decent way to put it. Um, but it, it's, it's so pertinent and so... It's always burning, that seems, until we've conquered the engine. The wheel, keeps, <laughs> the wheel goes yeah, round. The wheel just keeps turning, and all those things are still. I'm, like, I'm a big. You know, one of the things I like the book collection so much is because of the historical pieces, and I'm a big proponent of. We, we got to read history. I mean, and and a lot of people don't. You guys clearly do. But um, a lot of people that I in engage with that are in their 20s and 30s, I'm old enough to say, oh, well, this happened in 65 or 68. And this is not new. This is, it's happening again and again and again. So it's really good to reference that kind of material. Jim Crow, same thing. It's the same thing. We've never resolved those problems. Just turn them into something new that's usually right. even more oppressive and all encompassing. That was one of our major at least my major goals within going to Occupy last year and stuff was trying to present these educational aspects to people who are who who seem like like something just broke and it's time that we fix it. It, it was it was really nice for those people who wanted to be educated to realize that this is a continuous thing that is constant. Like it's a constant cycle. And there are tools within our books for organization and the strategic aspects that we need to be Nineteen eighty four. Nineteen eighty four. Yeah. Nineteen eighty four. Four well. All right, this one. Um, my last worker pick was David Holmgren's book, uh, Permaculture: Principles and Pathways Beyond Sustainability. Um, which I really liked because I first started hearing about permaculture through Bill Mollison. And so uh, David Holmgren was one of his uh, associates, and they were kind of like forming the concepts and movements at the same time. And so it was interesting to hear from him because this book focuses 
less on permaculture design on the small scale um, and taking the principles it's used of, of observing you know, what's going on, seeing the connections between components. Mm -hmm. And every time that you interact with it in a new way, you take time to reflect on you know, the new information that yields. Um, and he really takes those principles and looks at larger systems of how they interact. Um, so really expanding permaculture, because I think permaculture is great and it is getting around a lot, but the focus is much more on I'm going to retreat to my little you know, permaculture. The individual whole, permaculture. Individual, as opposed to where can we see, you know, these these gardens, these communities, these systems right. overlapping and interacting. Right. Um, and this is what we're attempting to do with the project that I was telling you guys. That exact same reason that, you know, to connect all those dots and share those resources. So David Holmgren's permaculture. Okay. Did you have another um, one? Fiction. Yeah. Um, <coughs> uh, Crazy world. Um, Huxley. Aldous Huxley uh, Island. It is a utopia novel, not a dystopia novel. Um, uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, it's very interesting. I won't talk about it. You'll just read it and love it. <laughs> I'll say. Thistle says you'll just read it and love it. That should be the jacket blurb, right? <laughs> 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 What was the name again? The Subversion of Politics. Okay. And it's about the, um, it's a historical um, documentation of the Autonomia movement in 77. And then, um, and that was just really, really good. It's a great scene. Everyone should read it. It's kind of hard to get through sometimes, but it's really good. Is it, is it by like a collective or is it by a Is it going to be <laughs> available in the new and improved firestorm? I can make it available. We'll make sure it's available. <laughs> we'll sure it's available. Yeah. Okay, there you go. You guys can get it from firestorm. I, I would like a copy of that, by the way. Yeah, it's a really good one. Um, there's also, I'm reading right now The Career and a Failure, um, which is sort of an anarchist um, dialogue about, about how the capitalist system sets us up to fail. Mm -hmm. And um, and then it like brings in some queer politics in there, um, but it's it's really and then a lot of um, a lot of politics about education and things like that. And, and could you say that title really again? Means. The title again? The queer art of failure. Okay, art. And then I I've also been reading um, the new fuck you, which is <laughs> which is a um, book that we carry here. Um, uh, it's just about lesbian queer stuff. It's really, it's yeah, poetic, it's poetic, it's poetic. Yeah. and I, have it, it, I always have to add in a poetic thing, and, and um, I'm going to add my nitpick, because <laughs> it's pretty much it is. Yeah. A nitpick is um, a worker pick of something that you really hate, but that, <laughs> that you think that everyone should read so that they know how to debate it, and um, my nitpick is EGR, deep green, deep green Resistance. So deep Green fun. Resistance. Yeah. And that was a nitpick, huh? <laughs> yeah. Ooh, how does that work with the permaculture guy? Wait, oh, I'm, I'm super funny. I, <laughs> I don't think that the green resistance is not the only thing out there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, and so we're going to wrap up with saying thank you guys. I, I knew this was going to be good. It's better. It, it, I love, this is what I love about interviewing people is that I find these people and go, oh, this person's going to be awesome. And then for a week after that, I'm going, oh. <laughs> yeah, so this is, this is like one of these things. So I really appreciate you taking the time out of your day. And um, the, the people are really enjoying it. They're just scribbling down the notes on the books, and they're already having conversations about that. Um, they want you to, to change the name to the Other Possibilities Cafe. <laughs> That's our, that's our network name, the Other Possibilities Network. So before you guys go, well, I love to end every interview with this, and so we get you know a, a quad taste of this today. Um, what call to action would you offer to people that are listening? <laughs> Wait, who are we talking to? <laughs> I'll do whatever I want. These people in the box, you know. <laughs>
Yeah, yeah, the people that are out there in the universe. So, as 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 an activist and as a part of a worker-owned collective, what call to action would you give to people who are watching and listening to the interview? We'll come back. We'll come back to you. You can digest. You, I can see you have 50, and you're trying to slow act. Yeah. Okay. Um, with the election approaching, I would invite everyone to push the discussion about the lack of choice in the American political system. Um, uh, because really, you know, it, it's unable to continue this way because the mainstream media excludes voices other than the two major parties. And, you know, I feel like it's becoming more and more apparent to everyone. And people seem less likely to even talk about politics because it's such a... Yeah, <coughs> uh, so... <laughs> no, I, yeah, I, I get it. I would just so press I people to be very real with themselves and each other about, you know, how much of an option voting is and what real steps we need to take to enact real change. Right. Great. Travis? Uh, I would encourage everyone, I'm not sure how familiar your viewers are or whatever, but go research anarchism. Um, find some people who identify as anarchists, get to know them. They're not scary, they're not going to break your windows or anything. Am I getting in trouble with you? Anarchists are the nicest people I've ever met. So uh, yeah, um, it's, that's it's something that you don't know about. Go, go research that. That's right. Well, thank you for that. That's a good point. Julie? I, I like the idea that Sosa kind of put out there, like problematizing something that's, that's on people's minds. And I guess with the Occupy, um, I would urge people to um, like interrogate that 99% versus 1% um, kind of breakdown that we've been given, which is in some ways really great because it's showing, you know, there's like this group of people who are so different from all these others. Um, who are like unified in a sense, but I would I would urge people to break that 99% out and look at what that 99% looks like, and maybe be a little bit self-reflective about the ways in which um, when you break that 99% down, what's going on in that 99%, and not in order to to brush yourself or in order to you know break some kind of coalition you have going, <coughs> but be really real about that and and when you break that out, you're going to see class, you're going to see race, you're going to see gender, you're going to see sexuality, region, all these things, um, immigration status, and, and figure out how to be an ally, a responsible ally around that. That's great. As I have said that we don't do enough of that. We should question everything. So, and would you like to, you have one? Yeah. Okay. I guess sort of bouncing off of what Julie just said, I think, I mean, most of the work that I'm involved in, I'm, as you guys know, I'm <laughs> like super involved in a lot of different things, but the, I feel like the one um, consistent strand of activism that I do is mutual aid, and whether that be like in the coal fields in West Virginia, um, trying to stop mountaintop removal, or if that's like here in Asheville trying to stop landlords from wrongfully evicting their tenants, um, to really think about community and how you can be a better participant in your community. And that's actually one of the biggest things about anarchism for me is, is that not only do I not, not buy into the bullshit capitalist ideal that like there is no community, I get to live in my four walls and, and have my like two and a half kids and whatever and, and not have to like give back to my community but that I really hold myself accountable to my community and try to do my best to, to give back to it. Um, and I see that again and again in my anarchist friends and um, there are tons of different ways you can plug in um, mutually. <laughs> That was wonderful. Well, thank you guys, all of you. Um, it's a great project. What you're doing here is fabulous. Um, and I'm hoping everybody can take some information away from it. Thank you for the book recommendations. Thank you for all your comments and everything. So this is, once again, uh, from Firestorm Cafe with the Firestorm Collective. These are four of the current six members of the collective. This is Julie and Travis and Thistle 
and Ali. Thank you guys. Alu. I'm sorry. <laughs> I thought I was going to go. I was like pat myself on the back, right? Alu. Thank you so much. Huh? Yeah. Thank you so much. All right. And uh, for all you guys on the OPN and the other uh, stations, uh, remember we'll do our Wednesday night call-in show. And if anybody has topics you want us to speak to, just contact Zena or Clearly or me. And um, we'll get those on, and we look forward to hearing your voice. Everybody have a good evening. Thank you for watching. We love you all. Good night.